My background is that I'm an acute care and trauma surgeon at Auckland Hospital and I'm the unit head of the acute surgical unit there. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest or disclosures other than to say that surgeons are hopelessly biased <laughs> about everything and it turns out I'm no different. Um, so I'll try to make this talk really about how things have evolved a little bit with our service and that might give you a bit of an idea about an approach to abdominal pain and some of the problems that, that we encounter as well. Just a few diagnoses to ponder about. <laughs> so as you can see, just navigating through the uh, abdomen you know, is, is, is a really difficult task and the challenge really with, for us is how to emerge from this quagmire really. But there are some goals and principles to follow. And these are the things that come to my mind when we see patients with abdominal pain. And the very first thing really that crosses my mind is, just think about this, is this patient got some sort of diabolical emergency, a catastrophic diagnosis that if we don't actually do something about very quickly, it might result in death. Some of this might be self-evident and obvious, but a lot of it can be a little bit difficult and subtle. You know, we're thinking about MIs. Doctors have missed MIs all the time. As surgeons, we've missed it as well. Um, we also think about then the acute pathology that you've got a bit of time that might deteriorate if you don't address it soon, but you've got some time. You know, and this is the appendicitis, the, di the diverticulitis, the biliary pathology, the pancreatitis, and so forth. And then the third thing running in the back of my mind is, is this presentation a, 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 in relation to something that might be a bit more sinister? Is there a tumor process? Is there a cancerous process going on? Now I think about things that might be progressive, uh, you know, such as IBD, Crohn's. And then lastly, we've got you know, chronic, chronic issues. They may be long-standing, intermittent. They may, it might be an accelerating problem or something that's plateaued for the patient. And this can be a difficult group uh, to work with altogether. But at least 10% of the time, we will really have no label, no diagnosis for the patient. I'm not going to um, focus on this too much. I think this is really just all based on anatomy and the possibilities. Um, I will highlight that pain in the upper abdomen uh, please do consider uh, MI uh, and uh, maybe a AAA as a potential differential. Um, we've had two patients with near misses in the last two months uh, that have been referred on to us by ED with biliary pain, as it turns out. We're absolutely, and I examined these patients, I thought, absolutely, this is barn door cholecystitis, but let's do an ECG just in case. And uh, a couple of occasions we found uh, ST elevation MIs. Uh, evolving ST elevation MIs in patients. So it, it is, it is a, a bit of a trap. The rest of it is all based around what could be the organ in the region. Uh, exam, I don't really have any tips or tricks, really. I think you guys can do this better than anybody else. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, people do PR exams routinely. Uh, I can say that we certainly don't. Uh, I think it's... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I don't think it's best practice still uh, if, you, if you think about the utility, the value, and even the diagnostic accuracy, it's actually pretty poor. Um, uh, and you know, if you're the patient, well, <laughs> it, you know, I guess I'd imagine it hurts. Um, routine investigations, uh, full blood count, use an ease, LFT, CRP, lipase, uh, and beta ATG as, as indicated. Um, CRP is something that's often debated. Uh, our intensive care colleagues don't use it full stop. They're vehemently opposed to it. Um, some of the physicians that we've worked with as well also don't see its utility with respect to uh, abdominal pain, but we always use it. We always use it. Um, and yes, the, part of the problem is it doesn't really have a cutoff value to determine pathology. Uh, in non-specific abdominal pain, and it can lag a white cell count, but it has helped us with, in terms of negative prognostic value, and it has helped us with predicting severity of surgical disease, and sometimes in the post-surgical patient as well. And there's a lot of good evidence around it, particularly for appendicitis, uh, where um, 
uh, you know, the, the, uh, if you have normal white count, normal CRP, after about two days of symptoms, likelihood of appendicitis is uh, less than 5%. I've just got a, a board saying five minutes to go, and I think I'm definitely going to go over that time, so probably cut into Adam Bartlett's talk a little bit, but we'll see how we go. Um, other tests, just be mindful, uh, MSU, uh, pyuria is often seen in appendicitis, PID, and diverticulitis. Uh, so don't be, um, uh, you know, confused by that. And extra abdominal causes of abdo pain, uh, always keep a few of these diagnoses in mind. Uh, we recently had a complaint against our service with a patient with severe abdominal pain, ended up with a CT scan, a gastroscopy, and an MRI scan, got discharged with no label, goes and sees a GP who diagnoses shingles. <laughs> got treated, <laughs> got treated, everything's great, and uh, put a complaint against our service, and rightly so, and I think that was, uh, <laughs> you know, a dropping of the ball there, really, wasn't it? Uh, investigations, x-rays, limited use for us these days, really limited use. Uh, but a chest x-ray, if you're thinking about one of those extra abdominal causes of uh, pain, um, you know, that can be helpful, perhaps. Uh, ultrasound's great for biliary stuff. Not good at looking at the common bile duct, but excellent for the gallbladder. Uh, in terms of diagnosing gallstones and a little bit equivocal with the uh, cholecystitis. You can have false positives and false negatives with it. But for gallstones and sludge, very accurate. Useful for pelvic pathology. For appendix, um, look, it's pretty specific. If it says there's appendicitis, then it likely is. Sensitivity is not as good. Uh, half the time, appendix is not seen. But if you combine that with your ge clinical gestalt, and blood tests, then um, you know the negative predictive value can be quite good. CT is really where it's at, and I can tell you that when we looked at our work in 2021, nearly 90% of our patients that were referred to us got, an, got some form of imaging, ultrasound or CT. 63% had a CT, and interestingly, only 58% of the time we found explanatory pathology and the remainder of them got either more investigations or we made uh, you know, a clinical diagnosis of something or the other. Uh, it does have a drawback of uh, finding of uh, you know, incidental omas of about 20%. That can lead to more tests. And there's also this drawback of radiation, which we feel, and I think a lot of the radiologists are coming to this idea as well, that's often overstated risk. Uh, because there are newer techniques that, that really dial down the radiation dose. Uh, we still try to avoid it in very young people. And uh, these are sort of common MRI uses. Uh, MRCP is good for the bile duct, um, MRI pelvis for pelvic masses, and uh, soft tissue masses. There's a real focus. There's a real focus on improving surgical outcomes, and, and uh, that really depends on expeditious diagnosis. The National Emergency Laparotomy Audit in the UK quotes a mortality rate of 12.5%. Perth Emergency Laparotomy, 10.3%. Uh, and Zela was still waiting on data, but Auckland Hospital last year, 6.3%. So we are. Uh, we feel we're ahead of the curve there. And that really comes down to us making rapid diagnoses uh, and therefore rapid treatment. And this is an, this is an article worth talking about a little bit. Um, uh, this is from our colleagues in Christchurch. During uh, COVID-19, uh, there was a successful trial of uh, community CTs being organized by primary care. They had a positive pathology rate of 51%. Nearly two thirds of the patients um, avoided uh, hospital admission, and that's quite that's fantastic. It may put a bit of extra burden on primary care, uh, but if it is, if there is, <laughs> if there is a way to work together, then I think it could actually benefit the patients immensely. Um, I'll quickly touch base. I've just got a couple of minutes to go. I'll quickly touch base on a few specific conditions and, and a few of the different things that are that are evolving. Uh, with appendicitis, look, there is no good way to tell you that this is how you diagnose it, right? Um, you, it relies a little bit on clinical gestalt. There are some scoring systems that can be used. You can find them on MedCalc. 
they're useful for negative prediction, but positive predictive value is really not all that good. Uh, imaging is really where it's at. Uh, we used to do a lot of diagnostic laparoscopies. We don't tend to do that much these days. And to put it into perspective, in 2018, our negative appendicectomy rate was 16%. Two thirds of our patients got imaged. 2022, it's down to 4.5%, and nearly everybody got imaged. Um, and that's because of COVID. Our practice changed because of COVID. We were not willing to, to undertake negative diagnostic laparoscopies. Um, occasionally, non-operative management of appendicitis. You may have all heard about all, uh, you know, managing these patients with antibiotics. It does work for appendicitis, but the CODA trial uh, from North America showed us that readmission rates were pretty high. So, um, and recurrence rates were high. So appendicectomy is still the treatment of choice. But very occasionally, you get a delayed presentation. Uh, the CT on the left is just appendicitis, uh, maybe with some microperforation. But the CT on the right, you can't even see the appendix, but you can clearly see like a mass that's evolving. Uh, these patients have already declared themselves as patients that have a localized process uh, evolving, and therefore they tend to re uh, respond to antibiotics. We avoid surgery because it often becomes a complicated affair. And we usually see them again with maybe a colonoscopy and a repeat scan. And, uh, because of a high recurrence rate and an appendix tumor rate of 2.5% offer them elective interval surgery. Quickly touch base on diverticulitis. Um, CT is the diagnostic tool of choice. Uh, one in 10 will require intervention. Um, if they have recurrent presentations to the practice, I would suggest, uh, look, if you are sure this patient has already had a you know, previous proof of uh, diverticulitis, you may just consider treat them empirically with antibiotics, that's fair. But if there are multiple visits, consider referral to uh, um, the outpatient services. Uncomplicated diverticulitis, we no longer refer for colonoscopy, uh, but if there is a microperf or perforation, then yes, they should get referred. Elective surgery thresholds are still very, very high. In the old days, if you had more than two or three episodes a year, uh, it could be an indication for elective surgery. I don't think that applies anymore. But certainly if you have fistulas or strictures or an inability to exclude cancer, then perhaps it might require surgery. Some evidence is involving that antibiotics are not required. And this has actually come from us, University of Auckland and University of West, uh, Western Sydney. Um, it's a pretty high powered paper. Uh, but to be honest with you, the truth is a bit more nuanced. We haven't changed our practice. We're still giving antibiotics. <laughs> um, like I said, a lot of biases. Uh, biliary pathology, nothing new to report, just a simple thing. Once you get one attack of biliary colic, even uh, likelihood of ongoing symptoms is high. So we still recommend uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, even if it was a singular attack of biliary pain. Uh, likewise for gallstone pancreatitis, high chance of this coming back again, we would recommend um, uh, same admission cholecystectomy. Uh, I will touch very briefly on bowel obstruction and then I'll finish off. Um, the main thing with bowel obstruction is very difficult to diagnose sometimes. We are looking for vomiting and abdominal distension. If you have a distal bowel obstruction, you will have more distension. That might be more clinically obvious. If you have a more proximal small bowel obstruction, you don't necessarily get the distension. And in some cases of obstruction, you might get a little bit of diarrhea as well. So it can be confusing when you think about differentials like gastroenteritis and so forth. But the biggest thing that you really don't want to miss is a strangulative obstruction. And how would you know that? It really comes down to pain. Pain that is out of proportion to clinical signs is a real telltale sign of something that is a bit more serious. So if you've got a lot of pain, irrespective of whether you think this might be gastroenteritis, uh, you know, I think it's, it's reasonable to consider referral and get some cross-sectional imaging. Um, I'm gonna leave you with some final points. Uh, this is the difficult area to get things right all the time. Uh, we have a readmission, a readmission rate to our service of 6%. When we send patients home without a clear label or diagnosis, uh, you know, nearly one in five of them will come back to us. Our service is always open and our aim genuinely is to have a non-refusal policy. We really, really wanna help 
uh, patience and help you guys out because hand on heart, I don't think I can do this better than anybody else. So we know it's difficult and sometimes uh, you know, it's easier to send them to us. If you have concerns, don't hesitate. And we are, of course, moving towards uh, uh, more objective assessments. So uh, there is a role of, uh, I think there, there should be you know, consideration given to finding pathways for community-based cross-sectional imaging to be available. I think that could work well for the future uh, for us. Um, always happy to be contacted. Please don't hesitate if there's issues navigating through patients that are acute but not quite acute. Um, if you need to get hold of me or if there's any way I can help, please do let us know. Thank you.